Kia ora, I hope this is no what is happening there, Rick. It's feeding. Kia ora, we are now live on um, AIA New Zealand's Facebook page. My name is Ian Jones. I am an AIA Vitelli ambassador. Um, for, for those with you, yeah, turn that light out. That guy there, we're actually in his home. He is the man we're about to have a chat with, a friend for, for many, many years, a uh, former Commonwealth Games swimmer, a gold medalist. Not in the swimming. No. Not, not <laughs> in the swimming, gold medalist for the 1990 Commonwealth Games held here. In, in New Zealand, in Auckland, of course, Rick Wells is his name. Me and Rick are going to be chatting about all things about mental resilience, life after sport. Both of us retired a long time ago, as you can see, but uh, still involved heavily in sport. People are going to keep on coming on right throughout the next five or ten minutes. We're on for about 45 minutes chatting about uh, mental resilience, as we talked about, all part, of course, of Mental Health Awareness Week here in New Zealand. Um, and if anyone has any questions that you'd like to throw to any of us, we'll be um, more of a chat than a Q&A tonight. Uh, please uh, feel free to do it, but um, I've already introduced the man himself, uh, Rick Wells. Thank you very much, my Thank friend. You. And at the very end, um, another thing, it's not just about uh, what we're going to be doing tonight. We're going to do another one maybe in February, uh, late February of next year. Myself and Rick and three others, so a team of five, are uh, raising funds and swimming a 100 kilometer challenge from uh, Great Barrier Island for those that know the Gulf, uh, Harry Golf up here to Takapuna Beach on the North Shore of Auckland so that's another thing we may touch on a little bit later on which will need a lot of mental strength. Yep, yeah, no, well it's, it's a good challenge eh? Yeah. And I think we all need challenges in life. Now for those that don't know much about AIA Vitelli, it's a um, science backed health and wellbeing program of course, rewarding Kiwis and uh, all those around the world. It's been going for 25 years, Vitality, uh, for looking after their health. Rick actually um, also has a job, apart from being uh, an awesome former athlete and swim coach. He is with the Morris Trap Group. If you ever want to get a hold of Rick, a life insurance uh, advisor. And you guys use a little bit about Vitality? Yeah, I do. Like, I'm being an ex athlete, I think you sort of goal driven and what have you and I, I enjoy the vitality thing like even tonight before you turned up I was about 400 steps behind <laughs> and so I was wandering around the house to make sure I got my 12,500 steps so it's a good little target that just makes sure that you do something every day. Obsessive um, former athletes I guess that's a bit of a plug one of the partners or two of the partners actually with uh, vitality is uh, Garmin who are fantastic and Fitbit I know Rick's got a Fitbit and they are the great, one of the great things, steps. And if you are like that or you want to get your points, train I spot. think if you try a yeah, train spotter, but if you want to be able to train properly on anything you do really, uh, use a Garmin <laughs> or a Fitbit. I often tell people, I do a lot of um, endurance sports, um, Garmin's and Fitbit's are actually there to make you go slow uh, when you're out of the blocks and, and going slow. But we want to talk a little bit, before we get into mental resilience, Rick, and talk a little bit about life after sport, just kind of set it up and set the scene. I know you didn't win a gold medal um, at swimming, but you represented New Zealand for about six years. So swimming, was that your first kind of sport? Yeah, it was. Like, um, I was, grew up in the Waikato on a dairy farm, and um, my parents felt that it was important that we got into swimming because a lot of kids drowned in rivers and what have you. And so we were in a small um, Waikato town, Tiaraha. Mm. Just all, we're about 10 k's out of Tiaraha. And... Um, we went to the Matta Matta Swimming Club for a number of years and then it just progressed from there. And then sort of you do the provincial champs and um, then you went on to the sort of national champs and then the representative. I also have a swimming uh, background as well. It was my first love. Still swim a lot today. Both of us still swim a lot today. So the sport of swimming, which um, I think is damn hard. I mean, it, it, it's, what, what did you learn from the disciplines of swimming? Oh, it, it is. I think it's one of the toughest sports that you could do because mm. you, you, you've got your head down, you, you're not chatting to anyone. Um, like I spent 10 years in lane 7 at the Mount Roscoe pool, you know, just in, up and down, up and down. And yeah, we'd swim 100 kilometres in a week um, in a training session. Mm. And that's, you know, sort of, it's pretty, um, you've got to be focused, you've got to be uh, sort of driven to get to a pool. Um, it was only when I got into triathlons later that I realised how 
there are other sports and you're outside, whereas mm. here you're indoors and going up and down a pool. The pool, he's talking about uh, the coach was Hilton Brown. Hilton Brown, one of our best, I think, um, swim coaches in, in this country. And he, did he look, was he on discipline or what was his kind of, what, what made him oh, such a good coach? No, I think it was just he's sort of, uh, he'd learnt as he went, I think, sort of, um, he made mistakes like all mm. coaches. Um, like I think in the 82 Commonwealth Games, we were overtrained. Like we swam 100 kilometres in the week leading up to the Commonwealth Games. And uh, by the time we got to the Commonwealth Games, we, all we mm. wanted to do was sleep. Um, I think he learned from that and he put that into practice, uh, not in my career, but in um, Paul Kingsman, who went on to win yep. a bronze medal in the Seoul Olympics. And he learned from that. You know, that sort of with us, we were overtrained, but <laughs> that's the way it goes. Paul Kingsman's actually a blast from the past. He's uh, my age. Rick, you wouldn't tell from this uh, video, is, is just a touch older than me. We never competed against each other. Paul Way Kingsman, older. of course, a yeah. uh, very good backstroker was Paul Kingsman. Some of the things I think swimming taught me was um, the ability to goal set. Rick talked about goal setting before. I think um, sw swimmers are very goal orientated. You work damn hard just to get microseconds of improvement. But I think one of the things I learned from goal setting was once you set a goal, once you achieve a goal, really important, and swimmers do this, I think, better than anyone else, to, to reset the goal. So onwards to the next step, I think that's one thing that taught me. And also taught me, and I'll get your thoughts on this too, Rick, because you, and we'll talk about triathlon soon, taught me to train tired. Swimmers are always tired. We do, you know, ungodly hours and, and big, big distances. So you kind of always... A little bit tired but you get through that and that's kind of helped me for for other sports that i played you represent new zealand at swimming you had a great career at swimming many many national uh, records and 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 titles etc why then or how and this is what we're going to do when you <laughs> won a gold medal you, you switched to, to triathlon okay well, a couple of stories here yeah, well, <laughs> okay. we got time this is interesting one, stuff one one i Used to, I came up from the Waikato and came to Auckland, and um, anyway, then I used to bike and run everywhere to get to the pool because I <laughs> yeah. didn't have a car, so that helped. And then finally, when I did get a car, um, I lost my license, <laughs> and so then I had to bike and run everywhere anyway. And now it wasn't the DIC, it was actually sort of I was involved in a, a motor incident, and so then six months lost his license, I was running around everywhere and biking everywhere and so then this triathlon came up and I thought, well, and it was a Les Mills triathlon and I thought why not and back then it was a, a bike run swim event and it was, and Les Mills was sort of probably the, I think the first company that embraced triathlon yeah, okay. in New Zealand and that would be 1980 I think and I was still training for the 82 Commonwealth Games, they came along so anyway, I did the triathlon. I think I finished about 15th and I declared never to do another one. You know, I hated it, but it was a 15 kilometer run. And, um, you know, the bike was first and it was back in the days of where the railway lines were in Key Street. Oh, yes, yeah. And so a lot of people want to come off yeah, the bike so railway was, line. And I think that's only why I finished 15th because <laughs> half the field was wiped out on the railway yes. lines. I think they'd done that myself. Yeah, and then the swim. And that wiped out the next lot because it was a cold day and of course you come from a bike jump in the mm. cold water and that wiped out the rest of the field and sort of i was either last or 15th i'm not sure and it parked that for a while and then after the 82 commonwealth games i think one came up in 83 or 84 and this time i got a little bit more serious about it and um enrolled the help of um graham miller who i knew yep the cyclist graham miller one of our great yeah. kiwi cyclists and his coach, Dick Johnson, yes. was his coach, and um, and then sort of learned how to ride and sort of, I can't remember whether I won that one or not, or came second to John Hellermans. Um, Who's still around and competing yeah, today, and I John believe. Were, uh, him and I have had a, a real love-hate relationship <laughs> over the years, I've got a lot of respect for John. And um, anyway, then sort of did that triathlon, I think I won it, or if it wasn't that, it was the following year, won that. and. Um, Next minute, you're sort of earning money or being paid money. And I'd spent years as a swimmer where you got no money. Mm. And suddenly you're getting this money and um, suddenly I decided to do triathlons. No money, just smell of chlorine. For those that are just joining us, this is um, an AIA Vitality chat, all part of the Mental Health Awareness Week here in New Zealand. My name is Ian Jones. I'm joined by uh, Rick Wells. 
And what we're going to be talking a lot about is the mental resilience in life after sport and how we handle a few of those setbacks and lessons that we've learnt. And um, hopefully you can send in some questions. Mohammed is saying hi, so good day to you, champ. Um, mentioned at the top that this guy won a gold medal here in 1990 at the Auckland Commonwealth Games. Um, congratulations for the start. Yeah. What an incredible to do that in front of your friends and family. Were you born? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was born, yes. I was actually playing with the All Blacks in 1990. But yeah. tell us about that kind of moment. Um, some of your kind of preparations, your anxieties maybe at the start, right? And, and then how you kind of felt after. Well, of course, you know, that, the 1990 was probably one of the most anxious games because um, it was on your home field. Mm. And there was a lot of expectations that you're going to win. And uh, there was a huge spectator mm, you know, yeah you know sort of a lot of people watching and it was actually one of the first races that my parents had actually came up and watched oh, it's bigger than yeah, them yeah yeah that's sort of um they came up from the Waikato and um watched it and because they they didn't quite understand the sport of triathlon and um so it was a real expectation to to win um and i probably wasn't in the best of shape that i could have been in um just i'm not sure why but just sort of and so I was very anxious about it before I started the race. And there was a bunch of good Aussie athletes, mm. you know, sort of about four or five of them that could have given me a hard time at any time. And, but fortunately, it sort of, I prevailed yeah. um, and won it. And it was a real highlight, you know, sort of, um, and, and sort of it was a, an emotional moment, and especially with myself and my parents yeah. to be there at the same time. Well, um, I mean, that, that's fantastic. We'll talk about the word, because I also do a lot of events and get anxious. We all get anxious, and you talk about anxiety, and here you are, a world champ at short and long distance triathlon, about to compete in front of your friends and family here and win a gold medal, yet you still get anxious, right, lining yeah. up to uh, to the start line. And I mean, why do you get anxious when you're such a great athlete and you know, meant to win, and how do you kind of overcome that anxiety? Well, I think it's all about preparation preparation and I think mm. sort of when you know that your preparation's right and you all have indicators and it's pretty similar in business or anything you know that's sort mm. of done this done this done this and but unfortunately in sport unlike business you know if you this and your KPIs all line up but you've got this to hit <laughs> <laughs> on race day you can wake up and tell me it ain't gonna happen you know like you, you can you can do as many Hail Marys as you mm. like but you just know as soon as you get it, sort of either hit the water and start swimming or hit the bike and you feel it in your legs, you're just going, I'm in trouble today. And um, probably leading up to that race, I sort of hadn't had the best preparation, hadn't done as much training as I should yeah. have done. Um, probably felt slightly sort of, um, what's the right word, not toned or overweight, and probably carrying a kilo more than I should have. And so I was nervous about winning it. And... Um, but you know, so I dug deep and um, but it's for it. quite a good. It, it, I almost won yeah. through fear. Right. Yeah. It was almost okay. the fear of losing. Interesting. Than than the the exhilaration of wanting to win. It was almost like shit. I can't mm. lose because I'm going to look like an idiot. It's actually quite a good example, though, isn't it? That uh, no matter what level of athlete you are, we we all get yeah. anxious at the start line. Isn't it? You oh, might God. be standing there at the start of the round, the bays, or lining up for your first triathlon or you know the ocean swims which are very popular and you will be nervous and you look around everyone looks calm they're not uh, even the best guys are oh, and that's quite it's quite over. reassuring it's to know. yeah they're all you know it's just how you mask it mm. like i remember in the, um and sort of probably where i learned that is that something that you build and you learn from you know like in the 1990 swimming nationals i was i qualified we had heats and then you had finals and i qualified like I was just a rough boy from the Waikato and I qualified fastest for the 200 freestyle. And this was the Olympic trials in 1980 and I was just a nobody and suddenly I was in lane four, fastest <laughs> qualifier. And all the senior boys were giving me a hard time like because you, you sit in these blocks of seven before the race and there's a bit of banter going on and you know, sort of everyone giving everyone a bit of jip, which I wasn't because I was just a new boy. And all these guys were leaning out going, mate, you're the top qualifier, <laughs> you're this, you're that, you know. You must be really excited about having that, you know, going to the Olympics or going to this, and you, you know they're, they're, they're sledging you, you know. And I'm just dying a thousand deaths, and I think I finished fourth in that race. 
and so but you learn and i think sort mm. of the experience is a great teacher and it, you, you learn that from that experience and then you just put it into the next one and then you learn again and um sort of after a, you know a few years you, you get better at it and it, you, you never learn how to um what's the word deal with, you just learn how to yeah. control it Oh, I tell you, we do organize this. There's a real good question coming. I'm going to put to uh, Rick from Rachel Boyd saying, Hey guys, I'm running my first marathon in November. Uh, good luck with that one. Yeah. Um, 30, well, it's 42K, 42 but it's really 30K yeah. 30 you know, of enjoyment. And the last 12K is going to be tough. Do you have a mantra to use to motivate yourself when the going gets tough? What, what, I mean, that's a great question, actually. But, you, but I think, it, Rachel, you've got to find out what motivates you. Like, why are you doing it in the first place? You know, sort of, and there could be a reason for it. It could be, like, some things that people would say, negative comments always used to motivate me. You know, it was almost, you can't do that. You're too big, you're too this, you're too that. And so that would just motivate mm. me to go out there and actually, I'm going to prove you're wrong. So first of all, you know, like sort of what motivates Ian or what motivates me might motivate you, but you've got to find out first why am I doing it? Set yourself a goal, and then you just sort of you lose use little tips along the journey of your training to sort of go. And that's why I think it's important to keep a diary of what you've done, so that then come two days before race day, you can look back and go, I've done the distance, I've done the mileage, I've done everything, I'm well prepared, and I'm ready to go. And then you just enjoy the moment, you know, and enjoy the exhilaration of actually doing something that actually, when you look at statistics. You know, sort of, you're doing something that 99% of the New Zealand population won't be doing, and so you should be proud of that for a fact. Making the start line is a, a, is a achievement. Yeah, well done, Rachel. Congratulations that you signed up. That is the biggest hurdle. Uh, when you get yeah. to the start line, make sure you smile. Yeah. Take it all in because you've done so much sacrifice, and no doubt your uh, your family is sacrificed as well with all the training that you've done. So that's your motivation right there to finish and see how proud they are uh, once you get through across that uh, finish line. So smile at the start, smile right through, take in all of those kind of key little moments that Rick was talking about, and maybe break it down, because 42K is epic. <laughs> it is just a beast. But, you know, 5K isn't, or 1K isn't, or to the next corner kind of isn't. As you, you tick those off, I'm sure each you'll... Step. Um, each step. Um, you know, just keep moving forward, but uh, absolutely fantastic for that. Rick, one of the, the, well, the theme uh, this week for uh, mental health awareness here in New Zealand is reimagine wellbeing together. So mates, talking with mates and helping each other out. You talk a lot about your swimming background, which well, it's not because we're both swimmers. A lot of people say it's an individual sport and yeah, you're doing a lot of work yourself, but you're around teammates. You then went to triathlon, which is maybe an individual sport. So when the going was kind of getting tough or when you needed people to chat to, I mean, who did you turn to? Yeah, like, basically, I was just the end result. Like, I was lucky I, I had good coaching sort of behind me, you know, like sort of enlisted the help of Alison Rowe, um, Graham Miller were helping me. Um, and so I did a lot of bike riding with Graham Miller, mm. um, a lot of running with Alison Rowe. And I think sort of, and then sort of, then of course you had your family behind you, you had your um, friends. And so I was just the end result, you know, sort of basically behind you, there was still a big support network, yes. you know, like sort of, it mightn't have been a team as such, but it was a, there was a big support and which gave you belief and confidence in your, your, your ability. Um, and so that was a big help. You know, so it sort of wasn't really an individual sport. Like, I, yes, I had to line up on the start line, but sort of behind me, I knew that there was a lot of support. But did you ever have moments where you kind of felt you're alone or maybe you were, were under the pump? Or, or I, mean, I, I know you, you were in a different uh, era to, to what we are today, but... Oh, I totally. Mean, like, you sort of, you know, you, you're alone. Like, when I first went and lived in San Diego, it's sort of, you know, you're on your own, you're mm. sort of you're making your way, um, you're following just, um, I was used to fax, so I think it was fax. Could have been curry pigeon. <laughs> curry or sort of the main Smoke thing. signals. Yeah, but uh, I'm pretty sure it was facts. Your training session, then you just had to follow that, you know. Right. And yeah, it was dousing. I'm not saying it was easy. Like you just, mm. you, it was a real roller coaster. Like and dare I say it, there were some days where you had what we called DTYD nights. Oh, not DTYD nights. Drink till you drop. <laughs> you know, and we just 
<laughs> we'd just go train and ship. Yeah. We're just going to go out and have a few beers. Yeah. And, well, and you'd have a blowout, and then next day you'd get up and you'd go again. And I know it's probably not that PC to say that now, but that's what we did. Well, ethics um, before science yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Hey, we 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 see your career winning the gold medal is, and winning the world champs, and you kind of see. For some, my career of playing for the All Blacks, but that's the, the kind of highlights, right? Well, it's like the iceberg. Yeah. So, what, I mean, how did you handle, or did you have setbacks along the way, and kind of how did you overcome those setbacks? Oh, totally. Like, to me, I always used to look at sport as probably 90% down and 10% up. Mm -hmm. And it was when you got the 10% up that it made everything else mm -hmm. worthwhile. Whereas the rest of it, like, generally when you're training, you feel like crap. You know, like, it's not like, oh, you're hidey high. You know, you're tired, you're sore. Like, I can remember your shoulders are burning, everything's burning, everything's sore. And then there was the people coming along saying, you can't do this, you're too big, you're too fat, you're too this, you're too that. Um, or just, you didn't make a team. Um, like in the swimming team, you might make that team, or you, you didn't get sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I, I'd try and turn that, and I guess it's sort of our family had a saying of um, don't let the bastards grind you down. Right, yes. And so we're just, okay, I'm going to do this. And so that was, you know, from, probably coming from a farming background, you just you had that resilience where you just, okay, it's raining outside. Well, so what? Get up and you get going. And you just kept on going. And uh, I think being brought up on a farm taught you that resilience of you yeah. just get up okay. and you just get going. Hey, those who are just joining us, welcome along. This is the AIA Vitality Chat with uh, Rick Wells. Rick is a former Commonwealth Games gold medalist in triathlon. I think everything's uh, former. Yeah, yeah, I'm a former, uh, yeah, former, former All Black, uh, but AIA Vitality ambassador here in New Zealand. We are talking mental resilience. We're talking life after sport and just talking a whole host of questions um, from what we've learned and the sports that we love and still kind of competing a little bit in the sports that we love but Rick just picked up on parents and I think parents are really important as well because we've all had setbacks in your life and I remember my like I never made any New Zealand team ever up until the All Blacks so I missed out on the secondary schools I missed out on the 19s in all to the trials but uh, you know 21 years of age become an All Black and she always used to kind of two things really Rick Sometimes he was too big. He's 81 kgs when he was a triathlete, so you can hardly too big, but he was at, at 81 kgs. I was always too skinny. And my mother always kind of said, you've got to turn negative thoughts into positive thinking. So the same thing, you've got to you know, prove the bastards wrong. Um, and so people are always going to say, hey, he's not good enough, or hey, you're not ready, or hey, you know, the guy's just not, not um, skillful enough. But you can turn all that if you believe that you can't, you are good enough. And, and that positive mindset, I reckon, always changes that. But Rick, now because we're talking about Mental Health Awareness Week here in New Zealand, there's a, a lot of emphasis. And this is part of the Vitality program too, which is cool. It's not just about the physical, it's clearly about the mental well-being. And, and maybe this is quite a tough question to, to answer, but I'd love you to try and define it if you can. I'll, Hopefully, do the same thing. Um, how you define kind of and what's mental well-being for you? To me, okay. So, <laughs> Jesus. yeah, I, I'm not an expert, but to me, for me, the, the two, the, the external and the internal, go together. Like I think, sort of generally, if I'm feeling good about my physicality and my just, work, if I'm healthy and fit, then that makes me feel better about myself. Um, then sort of like my journey like i went from being an athlete at 80, 80 odd kilos mm -hmm. and when it ended I, I think i bloomed out to about 108 110 kilos um which cost me a fortune in clothes <laughs> um, but you know it, it's sort of uh, what i've learned over the years is just that if i can feel good physically mm. I feel good mentally and then that sort of helps me handle anything that life may throw at me along the journey because the one thing that no one can take away from you is your own physical well-being physical mm -hmm. well-being you know people can do mind games with you and all that and sort of play with your mind but physical well-being can't be taken away that's up to you mm -hmm. and it's up to you to get out the door and just go for a walk like, like some days I just go for a walk that's all I do it's just a you know a 20 minute walk and I just put it in sort of 10 minute blocks. If I can do a 10 minute walk, that's better than no walk. If I can do a 20 minute walk, that's better than 
Ten yes. minutes. And so I just do baby steps like that. And then other days when I feel like it, I'll, I'll, I'll push myself out and sort of break into a jog or go to the gym and do some weights and what have you. And, and plus swimming. So it's sort of just about, so to answer your question about mental wealth, I think that the two go to well, go together yeah. for me. But, you know. Now this, we don't want to make it too much of an ad for uh, AIA Vitality yeah. in that program, but we're very, very passionate about it. Um, Rick is a um, insurance salesman, kind of on sales, or up sales, I guess, Vitality program. Advisor. I'm an uh, advisor. I'm an ambassador for it. But the Vitality program kind of mirrors that, doesn't it, in oh, terms of your physical like, and your mental well-being? Because I'm a bit of a train spotter, or, you know, like when I go back to my athletic career, you know, if we were doing a 200 kilometre bike ride and we finished at 199, <laughs> I'd probably ride up and down the street until I hit 200, which is, you know, when I look back on it, you go, you dickhead. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. just a bit anal. And then as I got older, as an athlete, I'd just sit in the driveway and spin my bike wheel around. Ah, my that's hand. a smart <laughs> tip. There we go. For you know, all those other nerves out there. You know, there's so, still plenty of people around doing yeah. that. And so, you know, but anyway, that's just as you get older. But what I find about the, the Vitality program is just, you know, sort of a, it gives you a purpose and a target mm. to achieve. And I, I guess that comes back to goal setting and, and stuff like that. But, you know, with the, the Vitality thing, even as I said before, you know, I was walking around here to make sure I did my 12,500 steps. Because um, if you hit your points, you actually get rewarded. And there's some amazing rewards out there, your points, and there's new world vouchers, and there's, you know, discounts off Garmin and Fitbit. So... Absolutely worth doing, uh, Sharon uh, Irving's uh, tuning in. So, hey, hello there. For me, just very quickly, mental well-being, very much the same as Rick, I suppose, but it's about having balance in your life, you know. Our family talks a lot about these kind of buckets, you know. You've got community and family and work and, for me, training and events. And as long as all those kind of buckets are, are full and in balance, then my mental well-being is in balance. As soon as you get out of kilter, and um, mate, we've all been there, done that, and get obsessed in, in one direction and, and forget about other things, uh, then then life gets out of kilter and, and we all get out of kilter and, and it's not not so good. Mental resilience. You talk about a lot about growing up in the Waikato, you know, you're from a farming background and farmers are the, you know, God bless some good Kiwis uh, out there. But mental resilience and, and the need to kind of sit at times, just roll your sleeves up, I guess, and, and, and get out there and put a smile on, put your shoes on and go. Is that kind of mental resilience to you? Totally, totally. Like I I think it's something that can be developed. Right, I okay. Think, I think it's something that okay. can sort of, and look, I'll stand up there for the next week says, no, it can't be developed. Whereas I just sort of think, um, and this is just from my own experiences, um, probably an example for me would be for the 1991 World Champs Triathlon. Um, I came back to New Zealand early and I was training in New Zealand um, for a race in the Gold Coast. It was the World Champs in, uh, in the Gold Coast. And I can remember riding over the Waitax, uh, Waitakere Ranges one time, and it started hailing. And I just said to myself, nobody, <laughs> nobody in the world is dumb enough to be out here in the hail. And I said, so you better race well in sort of September, whatever day it was, because to make it worthwhile. But it just made you tougher. Yeah. It made you tougher. And so then you go, I'm yeah. tougher than anyone else out there. And I just said that to myself over and over again. And so I guess that's sort of, because you just sort of put little things going, nobody else is doing this. Oh, I am doing it. And so, whereas I can remember as a little boy, you know, sort of getting out of the Morrinsville swimming pool, crying to my parents because the water was a bit cold and my eyes were a bit bloodshot because back in my day, we didn't have goggles. We just were told to swim. You know, and so the chlorine stung your eyes. And I remember bawling my eyes out going, I'll take up running, I'll take up anything. <laughs> Just don't get, put me back in the water. That, uh, so, that yeah. is, I'll get back because I want to about, talk about how to train mental resilience. But Rick and I haven't chatted about what we're chatting about here tonight. But I have a very similar story to John Eels was, was one of my big competitors out there. And we used to do lots of aerobic training under Laurie Mains. Just huge amounts of 150s, I'd call them, which is basically running the length of the field. And it was always, is John Eels out there doing this? You know, is he doing 20 of these or 25 of these? Or is he doing the extra? And the answer in my mind, uh, even though I think he probably was, uh, the answer in my mind, he wasn't. And, and by me doing that extra, yeah. actually, I felt I got a win over John Eels. And 
Shame if he's laughing. I was laughing at your your DT control drop. Yeah. So that's quite funny. So that's a good question because this is good for modern athletes at the moment. Young guys coming through, you're a coach and have been for what, 20 odd years yeah. down the new market yeah. pool. Can you then teach an athlete to be tough, to be mentally tough? No, I don't think you can teach it. They've got to learn it. Right, okay. You, know, you know, they've got to go and, you can't teach it, but they've got to go and learn it. They've got to go and just experience it. You know, like they've just got to go and do that. Like, I know it's a, a bit of a cliche, but they've got to go and do the hard yards. Mm. You know, that's, it sort of it staggers me sometimes when I sort of see athletes because it might be raining out there or that might be um, windy. They go, I'll just ride on indoors on the wind trainer. And you sort of go, well, what happens on race day if it's windy and raining? Okay. And how do you experience that? And we all know that on your bike, on dry conditions versus wet conditions, they don't handle the same. Right. So you've got to adjust that. You know. So suddenly if you're a fair weather athlete with no wind, no nothing, and I remember um, when I first went to San Diego to live and train, I was amazed, like I went out training one day when it was raining and all the locals looked at me as I was mad and they go, w why are you training? And I go, well, it's my training day. And they go, yeah, but it only rains once a day, uh, once a year, <laughs> you know, yeah. really here, yeah. so we don't train in the rain. Um, so I think you just got to experience it and, and you develop and you, you learn skills how to yeah. deal with it. Once more, it's, it's so interesting chatting to Rick here and I know we've got a lot of in common, we do the same sports a lot, but we... You know, we have the same similar stories. I'm sure there's lots of other stories out there too because my sport, rugby, and, and everyone wants to know the, the tricks of the trade, right? Everyone wants to know the easy way. Well, there is no easy way, no. is there? And sometimes you've got to learn the trade before you know any kind yeah. of tricks. And there's no shortcuts to success. And everyone goes, what is the, what is the golden bullet to win a, a gold medal um, in the Commonwealth Games? And I, I assume it's just hard work. That totally, sounds right, good totally, people. Totally, it, it, there's nothing like. Should have went. No, there's there's no easy way. Like it's 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 preparation, it's mental resilience, it's mental toughness, um, and and basically it's the last. You know they say it's the last. What is it? Whatever your head is, two inches. Well, some are two. Yeah, yeah some, some are less. Some, some are more. But you know it's because we all train pretty similar, we all yeah. get fit, mm. but it's those that want to actually really go and hurt. You've yeah. actually got to hurt. It's, it's conditioning yourself to learn to hurt for whichever period of time, whether it be an 80 minute game of rugby or a two hour tri or one hour 50 triathlon mm. event. It's the ability to sustain that pain and stay focused and be smart while you're doing it. Like I think, Everyone laughs at athletes and you know they're just jocks and all this, but most top athletes are reasonably intelligent in the field that they work, you know, sort of in, in working, you know, yeah. sort of in racing, and they have a some sort of I don't know the word, but just they can work out how to get to that point smartly. Absolutely, that, that's a good answer for those that are just tuning in. Welcome along to AIA New Zealand's Facebook page. My name is Ian Jones. I'm an ambassador. For AI Vitality, the guy sitting next to me, good man of mine, Rick Wells, former Commonwealth Games gold medalist. And we're talking about mental resilience and life after sport, which I want to talk about now, yeah. Rick, because he had a great career as a professional, only in the early days, let's be honest, but in professional in um, triathlon. And then he went from a pro athlete to a retired kind of athlete. How, did that have any any um, effect on your mental well being? Oh, totally, totally, totally. Like in. We didn't talk about it. You, you just suddenly you go from one day you get a phone call from sponsors and what have you, and you know you're probably 33, 34 years of age. We're not going to sponsor you anymore. We've got a change of direction, and this yeah. is something uh, sort of that I hadn't trained for, hadn't prepared for, and suddenly it's well, what do you mean you're not going to sponsor me anymore? I, and you like me, <laughs> and suddenly it's gone. You know, and so then basically you're almost unemployed. And also, you're 34, you're not as fast, everything's aching, um, you're not as nimble, um, other life things have come along in the journey, and suddenly, shit, what do I do? And yeah. me, for one, I never really had prepared for that, and I'd had plenty of people probably advise me on what I should do, I didn't listen to them, because I just thought this was, roller coaster was going to go on forever, yeah. and then it ends, and suddenly you go from sort of people inviting you to functions and all this sort of stuff to suddenly the phone's quiet you know sort of and um 
So how did you kind of handle that? Oh, I probably didn't. Yeah. You, you know, like I, I drank and ate a lot, or I didn't eat a lot. I just stayed eating the same I was, and that's probably why the weight went from 81 kilos to 110 yeah. kilos. Um, drunk too much. Um, and probably if I can talk about it, like a defining moment was at Eden Park, probably watching UK or, and I was, this is back in the days where you're allowed a cigar and what have you, and I was- Boarding at Eden Park. <laughs> yeah. And I was smoking a cigar and drinking a beer and anyway, this little boy came up to me, obviously pushed by his parents, because I'm surprised he recognized me at 108 kilos. And um, he asked for my autograph. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sort of smoking away and sort of <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know I remember handing my beer and my cigar to my mate and, 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 and sort of signing it and just cringing because I was uh, and it was a real sort of wake up call for me it was, it was Rex you better get your shit together because the track you're going down it's not good mm. you know and you know I didn't have any um, what's the word moments I suppose just hell not... it was just I just realised that I was going down a track that wasn't the end of that track was not going to be good. Yes. And so you, you sort of, and then basically the next day I went out running and my legs told me to get off me because I was too fat. Um, you know, and that hurt, you know, and suddenly it was a slow process trying to get back into shape. So they say one of the key, you know, there's five kind of key components, I think, to, to mental well being. And, and we talk a bit about connections. So mates, just being with mates, but, and we'll go through them a little bit more detailed soon, but one of them is, is being active. So were you just getting back into your kind of better physical state yeah, and help yeah. you? And, and that's what, thing? and that's what, like for ages I wasn't, like basically I parked my bike, parked everything, did nothing, you know, just did nothing. And then you got back and do, um, mm. doing something, something, you know, yeah. and, and it wasn't big, like it was 20 minute runs, you know, and just taking it from there. I'll tell you very quickly the story, because I'm fairly similar, I, I was playing professional rugby, well, I played First class rugby for um, I think 16, 17 odd years. And the last six months I was in England on my last pro contract, I was kind of starting to dream of this life, of a normal life, whatever kind of that that is. Uh, but a life that you're not being told to kind of train here and to dress there, etc. etc. I came home, um, didn't do anything for six months, and I didn't blow out to 108 kgs. I don't think I've ever been that in my life, but um, I just felt terrible, and that was kind of the same thing for me. I just had to, A, had to start training, and to force me to train, I actually started uh, entering events. And the thing that really, and I want to speak about planning, because it's one of the real pillars of Vitality is to plan well. One of the things that changed things for me, and, and once again, we're not experts, but this kind of helps me, is I write things down. If I yeah. kind of seen, and I know some plans go out the windows as soon as you write them down, but it's, yeah. for me, as soon as I write them down, I kind of feel that I've got some, you know, control. Yeah. Totally. Um, like, I, um, in my athletic day, planned religiously. Like, right. we'd have a big, long plan. And probably I lost that when I was sort of at the end of my mm. career. And it's sort of, I plan, I try and plan now. I don't do it as well as I should. Um, but um, I sort of, um, what's the word? I write a weekly plan each week. Yeah. And I go, this is what I've got to do. And that's okay. not negotiable, you know. Hey, Rick's just got someone at the door. Yeah. You're going to got me for the next yeah. uh, minute or yeah. two. But well, just, I'm you, just you, you pop over. Yeah. Because we are actually invading Rick's house, which is pretty cool. We're here for another six or seven minutes or so. My name is Ian Jones. I'm a Vitality ambassador here in New Zealand. Uh, the guy that has just left is a good mate of mine, Rick Wells. And we are talking about mental resilience. We're talking about mental well-being. This course all part of the Mental Health Awareness Week here in New Zealand. And it's about mates. And one of the great things that I have going for me, and I'm really, really blessed to have these, is a swim group and a cycling group that I've trained with for the last probably 17, 18 years. And it's it's blokes with similar interests to me, of course. And whilst we don't speak a lot about our feelings, we speak a lot about our family, what's going on in our lives, and just chatting. I think just chatting actually is what blokes sometimes need to do. You don't have to always um, give your deepest, darkest secrets to everyone. Maybe you've got family for that, but just chatting with each other is really, really cool. And that, for me, is, is one of the keys. That's connection. 
The other connection I want to talk to Rick about, because he's also done a lot of coaching, and one of the things I think is really good for mental well-being is giving. Myself, my wife and I, um, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, started a community food kitchen on the North Shore of Auckland called Eddie's Meals, and then we um, we're starting again actually 2nd of October because of COVID here in New Zealand and we just, because we have had a pretty blessed life and um, things have gone well for us, we wanted to share those blessings and we invite people from the North Shore community to come in and host you know, 30 or 40, anyone's welcome, Rosmini College, 6pm on a Friday night um, and we just chat to people and I think Rick, you and now are around guys with your swim group, you spend a lot of time of course in your business, chatting I, I guess is, yeah. is a key element to, to mental well-being. Like, the coaching is probably like I coach, mm. but it's actually good for me as well because I, I get to the pool and there's 30 odd motivated people that have got out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning mm. to go swimming and so that inspires me to be a better person with it because you go, well, they've all got out of bed. Yes. And so that makes it, I feel I've got to sort of reciprocate. Yeah. Um, and so it works both ways. Like a, a coach gets inspired by the athletes as well. I guess that um, brings us to another one of the key pillars of Vitality, which is plan well. So you being a coach, so you, I guess you've got to plan really well. So you have in your head what you want to do. Were you a planner as an athlete also? But were you, did you also use, because I know I did a lot, um, Visualization or just kind of mental rehearsal? Oh, totally. Like, even though I was sort of kind of a, a farm boy and pretty rough with it, um, I got the help of a psychologist. And, you know, if I tell you this stuff, you'll think that he has it back in 1990 or 89 that you'd go use a Fruit Loop. But um, this guy taught me a, the whole techniques to relax, you know, sort of lying in bed. And just going over and over and over in your head that on and he'd say whichever day the race is name that and name that date like whether it be the 21st of september on, on this you go and you picture the day whether it's going to be a blue day rainy day whatever day he said you just go through it and um but also then he taught me about how to take strength from the ground and oh, i know nice. some of that, um, okay sounds really weird yeah but it'll connect with a lot of people and um and but also he said while you're out running in your two hour runs and what have you stop at a tree and just touch the tree you know just touch the tree and take energy from and ask the tree for energy and i know like i kept a lot of that to myself back then because i think some people would have thought i was a, <laughs> a nutter but um you know so i'd be out running and i'd touch and but also i and he said also start psychologically taking energy from your competitors oh, okay. or people that you're running yes. with Yes. And so I started, and I know it sounds stupid, and he, he should have showed me ways to do it, you know, breathe deep and just go sort of, okay, so I'm taking energy from Ian right now. And whether it worked or not, it was a placebo right, effect, yes. I guess, and I'd suddenly feel better. And it was sort of weird, but that's sort of the whole, you know, sort of writing things down and just at, at night lying down and just sort of saying over and over again, yes. on a certain day, I am going to feel great, I am going to be strong, I am going to be tough, I am going to be resilient. I'm going to persevere. Whatever the race throws at me, I will deal with it. And so, did a lot of that. Well, that's a pretty good summary, I reckon, about what we're talking about here. Mental uh, resilience, of course. Um, you know, that transition, of course, from former athletes. Not everyone's a former athlete out there, but they're all going through the same kind of issues as well. But you can stay grounded, can't you? I think, you know, turn those negative thoughts into positive thinking. That, for me, is a real key one as well. What about emotion? Because... Sport, business, everything is about emotion, right? Did you have anything or any tips how you can kind of control emotion? Well, sort of, I think most sport is done on emotion. Mm. But what I've learned in business is to hold that emotion. And don't, like probably I wear my heart on my sleeve too much. Um, whereas what I've taught myself in business is just to sort of count to 100 before you either press send or don't send or whatever, just hold back and, and just read it again and go and try and flip it around and go, would I like to receive Yeah, oh, yes, nice. Um, now in sport, sort of, passion goes a long way, but that only lasts for about 20 or 30, whatever, whereas the race could be a two hour race or whatever. And so it's got to be controlled aggression. Mm. And basically that aggression has got to be, like I always raced on 
aggression and sometimes to my detriment, sometimes the thing, but sort of I'd go out hard, I'd just go, go. But it had to be controlled and it had to be sort of for the duration of the race. You can't rip into something for the first 10 minutes and then you go, oh, I'm mm. done now, my aggression's gone because suddenly you go, oh, shit, I've got another hour to go yes, yeah. and then I'm in trouble. So then it becomes controlled aggression and calculated. Clear head thinking, eh? Yeah. That's really what you're going to have. Hey, we're going to wrap things up because we've taken a lot of Rick's uh, time. I said... Yeah. We'd touch on this and maybe we'll do more a little bit later on maybe february next year but um just very very quickly um rick you came to me with a crazy idea of swimming from great barrier island uh, which is literally 100 k's away from where we're sitting at the moment um to raise funds who, who are we raising funds for and uh why <laughs> okay well firstly it was an idea that's been bowling around my brain for about two three years um, sort of challenge and basically I like to put things out in front like sort of as you I've done the Waiheke swung from Waiheke to Auckland and then I was thinking what's next and then I thought well why not barrier and then during the lockdown I saw that St John were in a little bit of financial difficulty mm -hmm. and I thought well St John's are there for everyone you know sort of um, there's a whole lot of charities but St John's actually encompasses the whole whatever's going on in life we all, like I, I've used them in my triathlon days. I've picked me up a couple of times after the races. I'm sure they've been at the rugby fields that you've been at. Magic um, water. Yeah, course. exactly, you know. And they're there for everyone. And so then it was St. John's. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll do that. We will come back. There's five of us um, swimming. We're going to do it in relay uh, fashion. Really interesting story of, of the other three that I'll introduce you to. Um, to maybe in February of next year. But it, um, it's epic. So just before we sign off here, I think uh, Rick, you know, absolutely um, from the bottom of our hearts, a couple of things from me about mental well-being, stay connected, keep in contact with keep you, talking. keep talking, that's uh, absolutely what you've got to do, keep learning too, um, Rick's been a coach of 20 plus years, always learning, always improving, don't stop, evolve, uh, evolve, evolve even a better word, I think give, a volunteer, um, totally. do something that you, you're passionate about. So give what you can give and you get so much back in return. Um, be active, I guess, is yeah. another one. Rips. That helps me anyway. To, you know, a lot about, you know, if, you, if you're feeling good about yourself mentally, uh, you're also going to feel good about yourself. And be thankful. I mean, we live in a damn good world here, don't we? We, we are blessed. Let, let's be honest. We are blessed. So I think uh, Rick summed it up a real nice story. A little bit for when you're outside, look up. When you look up, you see the, you see the blue sky. Uh, you don't want to see the ground. So look up and look around it, and even maybe touch a tree and uh, get some energy from a tree if you're that way inclined. But thank you very much for your company uh, this evening. Uh, it's been great being here with Rick. Um, and please, what, if you want to get in contact with any of us, of course, Rick is an insurance advisor with the Morris Trap Group. Uh, get in hold of Rick uh, via that, or you can get hold of me um, at Kamakid04 and I'll try and, well I will absolutely get in contact with you and if you want to live in Auckland, you want to have a run, uh, give me a call and I'll uh, meet up somewhere and have Go a run or, 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 not me. or come and have a yeah. swim with us at, yeah. at some come stage later on, why not? Um, that's what it's all about, but please look after yourself and as Rick said before, talk, talk to somebody. So, good night, yeah. thank you Cheers. for your time.